Good morning, everyone. Um, so for the next 15 minutes or so, I'll be taking you through a case study re-examination of the material culture of the cemetery of Manio de Yitria through a perspective that removes focus and monopoly of agency from humans with a view to better understanding the material culture of the site and the way in its entanglement with those interacting with it without forcibly excluding the human factor either since I will be bringing it all together in the end. Now, the cemetery of Monio de Yitre is a, is a communal cir circular Tholos tomb cemetery situated in south central Crete. Um, and it was founded around the final Neolithic Early Bronze Age and was in use until the Middle Bronze Age for a period of roughly 1,000 years. It's part of the widespread foundation of circular Tholos tomb cemeteries in the area, starting by the, the mountains here, followed by the Mesera Plain. And, um, Sorry, uh, and I, here I've put some of the most well-known cemeteries of the type, but uh, there are many more. And Monio de Yitre is the blue dot there, which I've chosen because of the high detail in its publication, uh, giving me a lot of data to sort of work with. Now, my, what I plan to do today is not to give a descriptive analysis of the archaeological evidence of the site that's done in the publication, what I want to do is highlight uh, very specific aspects with the interpretational approach followed drawing on concepts of sensor reality, material engagement, and entanglement. Basically looking at the way the interaction between humans and things work to shape both constituents, human and non, bidirectionally. And I'll be doing this by discussing first a few elements of the architecture, followed by the large ceramic deposits of the site, and finally the skeletal remains. Now, that is twisted. I apologize. That was not like that on my computer. The plan is a bit, okay. We'll work with it. So the main architectural components of the site include the two Tholos two cemeteries. That's horrible. I apologize. Um, a and B right here, um, a along with a rectangular building here, a so-called ossuary, some open, um, some open spaces, the walls of the cemetery and some other minor structures, which I will not be talking about today. Now, give it, about the tombs themselves, there is some controversy regarding their method of roofing, but if a roof is accepted, they would have been closed structures necessitating physical entry um, to engage with the interior. Now, upon entering the tomb, visual perception would have been very much limited and, and dependent on exogenic factors such as the weather conditions or the time of day and the time of year. For example, a study done on a similar cemetery in central Crete on a similar tomb gives us, a, gives us a reconstruction of the interior of the tomb at 7 a.m. in April, at 12 p.m. in June, with the option of a wooden roof, as well as with uh, the use of oil lamps. Now, in either case, it's evident that visual perception is limited, and the practices themselves would have been would have been very much shaped by this materiality of the tombs in the sense that affordances, accordances would have had to been uh, made to the practices with a view to either combating the darkness, for example, by, inco by incorporating the use of lamps, um, or actually incorporating it into the practices with a higher reliance on other senses such as smell, touch, and hearing, as well as the incorporation of the, the other sensory stimuli of the tomb, such as the cold dampness or the odors, um, into the practices. Now, again, with the twisted photo, which I don't understand, the, the spatial organization of the cemetery would have also enforced very specific patterns of movement within the cemetery, with, um, with the walls of the cemetery and the walls of the tombs being seen as sort of inactive signs in the sense that they're not merely communicating communicating or representing a boundary, but they're directly and actively enforcing that boundary. That's a bit better. Um, for example, if we look at the southern Perivolos here, it dictates that there is no afforded path pathway passage from Tholos B to Tholos A without redirecting the visitor outside of the cemetery and back in. It also means that, that Tholos A can be approached from, from all around, whereas Tholos B can only be approached from the front. And these different afforded methods of approach would have resulted in different afforded practices for each tomb. Now, the structures themselves also uh, would have directed movement as a group in, in the sense that 
Their entrances are both quite narrow, as are the rooms of the rectangular building from which one would have to pass prior to gaining entrance to Tholos B. This means that one person would be able to enter at a time, um, and so necessitating the negotiation and the formation of a succession. They'd have to decide because of this so who would enter first and who would enter last. And the limited spatial capacities of the tombs, but especially the rectangular building, um, means that a certain number of uh, participants would be able to enter at a time. And those not present at the time of, the pra of, of whatever's taking place would have had limited to any perception of what's going on, given the um, aforementioned visual limitations. So these, point these points all indicate a structural organization affording differential access to at least certain stages of the practices taking place. And so the, the existence of, for example, open courtyards should not necessarily um, be suggestive of a more communal or inclusive character of the practices taking place, as has been suggested. Now, onto the pottery, the, I will be focusing on the deposits from the rectangular building, um, and specifically those in the first rooms nearest to the, um, nearest to the entrance of the tomb. Um, these, uh, these are the two architectural phases of the rectangular building, the earlier one in the bottom and the later on the top. The size of these deposits is roughly similar in both phases, between 130 and 141 cups in either phase. And the broad chronological span of these deposits in itself is, is indicative of the significance that this engagement would have held in the practices taking place. And the first, the first deposits can be seen in themselves as, as, a, as a affording and enforcing the continual deposition in the same location. Um, and the strength and dynamicness, and therefore the efficacy, sorry, the efficacy of this sign can, um, it would have grown in association with the size of the deposit until it would have eventually been consolidated to, into custom or tradition or whatever you want to call it. Now, it's easy to think about the way that um, humans ascribe a meaning to the, to, the, to the ceramic. They would have ascribed a specific meaning. But I want to think about the way um, the, the, the cups would have provided a meaning with the person depositing them and in such connecting those contributing to the deposit right now with those contributing in the past and those to contribute in the future. And how human and things can be seen as tied together in dependencies and entangled in culturally and temporarily situated abstractions, resulting in the flow of power and meaning through these associations, ultimately allowing the humans to achieve certain goals. And finally, the, the accumulation of a large number of um, material, of a large size of material um, near the entrance and in the entrance itself would have resulted in the inability to stand and act on the spot of the deposit. You see here in a photo, it's just a progress photo of the excavation, but you already see the larger, the sizable amount of material, and this is just one small aspect of it. And this would have rendered the entrance and non-entrance and the passageway, a non-passageway, the entrance to the tomb is right here, by the way. Oh, you can't see my mouse. I'm sorry. Um, anyway, <laughs> now, oh, how can I go back? I apologize. I don't know this computer. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so here we see. So here we see how things how things would have allowed people again to to achieve specific um, capacities to achieve specific. Um, oh no. I'm sorry. I just got distracted. I'm moving on to the bones. <laughs> now moving on to the skeletal remains, which is. Um, Admittedly, an idiosocratic um, type of, well, not material culture, it's not material culture at all. There were once vessels of human lives, but, um, but their human nature and, most importantly, functionality fundamentally changes upon death. During, uh, and I have chosen to incorporate them today in this talk as something from, that has been seen as being manipulated by the living, as something from which agency has been removed in the past. So upon decomposition, the human body is subject to continuous transformation and transfiguration. And, and it is these decomposing and skeletonized bodies that would have impelled these people to create this, uh, this culturally and contextually appropriate um, area for their disposal. And to go even further, this, the multiscalar nature and complexity of the 
practices taking place at the cemetery can be seen as a result of this material fluidity with different material manifestations of the human body affording different methods of engagement. For example, if you will, the osteological analysis shows that the remains deposited in Tholose were first left to decompose in open air conditions, showing how a not yet decomposed body afforded a specific method of engagement, which is being placed somewhere in the open, we don't know where, and then upon commencement or completion of decomposition, this form of the, of the body afforded a different engagement, which is being entered into the interior, into the tomb. Now, another aspect of the skeletal remains I want to touch on is their high degree of fragmentation, which would have re rendered them unrecognizable and unidentifiable. You see here a drawing of, um, from the ossuary, as well as excavation photos. It's just a pool of bones. So if the living wish to maintain a sense of individuality um, and be able to recognize a specific member of the community, they would be forced by the materiality of the assemblage to act in a very specific way. For example, to place a pot next to the remains of the specific member and, and then move the pot with them when they're moved to the ossuary, which is an example taken from the cemetery. However, this knowledge and this ability to identify uh, the specific person is something available only to those present at the time and, and subject to, the, to, the, um, to, all the architectural limit, to, uh, to all the architectural affordances already mentioned. So what I've, been, what I've been trying to do is show how the non-human life has created afforded experiences for the humans. Um, and this is evident when looking at the antithetical element between the interior and the exterior of the tomb, between the, creating a distinction between the microcosmos of the tomb, the world of the dead, and the world of the living. It's also evident when looking at the way that the dead, reaching their limits in uh, materiality and fragmentation, would have been morphed into this undistinguishable, unrecognizable assemblage of people, of thing, of people and things. An assemblage that can be seen as transcending the temporality of the living humans um, in the sense that uh, it's an assemblage of people and things in tombs centuries apart, people who are young, people who are old, things that were created just before being deposited and things that were created centuries, uh, decades before and been already used. And this in a cemetery that had been used for over a thousand years, um, when the surrounding settlements seemed to actually be going in and out of use, not lasting too long, and moving all around it. So the cemetery would have been very much, um, uh, uh, would have been very much there in the perceptions of the populations, something that had always been there and always would. Now the intense old factory visual, aptic, and acoustic simulations associated with these experiences would have been stored and would have been stored into the memories of the participants. These memories would have been reactivated with every new burial, with every secondary engagement, at which time they are labile and subject to negotiation and manipulation. They also become stronger and more easily accessible with every reactivation. And it, these memories would have been evoked during future encoding with regards to and structuring perceptions of death and the way the dead were remembered. And um, it's through the manipulation of these memories that uh, social roles could have been actively uh, negotiated and consolidated. So I hope through, the, through this brief presentation that I've highlighted a few ways in which um, things not only shape afforded experiences for humans, but also structure in a way their minds and their perceptions. And through this, they play a vital role in the negotiation and the consolidation of social roles. Sorry for the little mishaps. <laughs>